Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's November 10th, 2021, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we take a look at the science of forest restoration and discuss how effective it is at delivering benefits for our planet and people. Largely in response to the global climate crisis, tree planting campaigns are especially in vogue right now. Initiatives have been launched in recent years to plant trees for the future, to plant a billion trees, eight billion trees, even a trillion trees. Trees certainly provide an abundance of benefits that can help solve a number of the environmental crises we're facing. Planting new trees doesn't just sequester carbon and help mitigate global warming. It can also provide badly needed habitat for wildlife and help address biodiversity loss. Trees can provide food and new sources of income for local communities while helping reduce soil erosion and prevent flooding. They keep our communities cooler as global temperatures are soaring and confer real psychological benefits for the people who live in and among them. But contrary to popular opinion, planting a tree is not always an unmitigated boon to planet Earth. Planting the wrong trees in the wrong place can actually lead to the destruction of native biodiversity and deplete water tables, causing water scarcity. Some trees planted for beneficial purposes have become invasive, forcing local governments to spend huge amounts of money and resources to remove them. Of course, forest restoration doesn't always involve tree planting. Forests can, and quite frequently do, regenerate on their own. So when is tree planting actually necessary? And when is it best to let forests restore themselves? And how do we create programs that unlock the potential of reforestation efforts while avoiding the pitfalls? To help us answer these questions, we speak with two experts in ecological restoration. First, we speak with Robin Chasden, a professor emeritus at the University of Connecticut, a research professor with Australia's University of the Sunshine Coast, and a reforestation consultant. Chasden tells us about the decision-making process that goes into designing a reforestation project, whether or not today's tree planting campaigns are likely to be beneficial in the long run, and gives us some examples of both successful and failed forest restoration initiatives. We also speak with Karen Hull, a professor of environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, who has studied tropical forest restoration for nearly three decades. Hull tells us about the conditions that are conducive to natural regeneration and the conditions that make tree planting absolutely necessary, plus what we know about the differences between planted and naturally regenerated forests and why it's so important for local communities to be involved in reforestation initiatives. There is a lot of potential and we see some really good examples of how we can really get a lot of benefits both ecologically and socially from restoring forests and other habitats. According to the UN, forests provide critical habitat for most of the world's terrestrial biodiversity, including 80% of amphibians, 75% of bird species, and 68% of mammal species. Forests are also an important carbon sink, sequestering twice as much carbon every year as they emit due to degradation and deforestation. How long that will continue to be true is an open question, however. Some scientists think the Amazon rainforest is already emitting more greenhouse gases than it's absorbing. It's estimated that some 420 million hectares of forest worldwide were lost since 1990. Though the rate of global deforestation has decreased over the past three decades, we're still losing 10 million hectares or nearly 25 million acres per year. Restoring degraded ecosystems like forests is so key to the future of our planet that the UN has declared the years 2021 to 2030 the decade on ecosystem restoration. It may not ultimately make sense or even be feasible to replant all of the forests that have been cut down, but reforestation is increasingly viewed as one of the most valuable natural climate solutions we can deploy to halt runaway global warming. As Robin Chasden tells us, though, the replanting of forests is hardly a new activity. Humans have actually been replanting forests for centuries. It's the current motivations for reforestation efforts that are a more recent development. Reforestation is not a new thing. I mean, it's the forestry... Uh, sector and forestry industry has been planting trees for many centuries. But this has been primarily within temperate and boreal regions and to supply wood for the timber industry. And it hasn't been connected directly with 
the other environmental crises we're facing, which include the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. So it, it initially was, was really part of a just forestry activity uh, around the world and also was expanding into the tropics quite a bit with eucalyptus and acacia and pine plantations in many tropical countries. I guess it's really been maybe about the past 20 years or so that these activities have become viewed within the larger scope of conservation and restoration around the world and to what extent of tree planting activities uh, are fit fitting more of a commercial forestry model production model versus becoming part of a greater societal interest in creating more forest cover, more tree cover, uh, more opportunities for livelihoods uh, that are sustainable, and integrating uh, forestry activities with sustainable development goals and as well with uh, activities within UN conventions like climate change and biodiversity. So that seems like that's actually a pretty crucial distinction that needs to be made between reforestation in the forestry sense, which can include monoculture plantations, and reforestation in the sense of restoring natural forest ecosystems. Well, it's it's not always such a clear distinction because there can be advantages within a landscape context of some commercial forestry operations. But strictly speaking, a monoculture type of plantation, particularly if it is not a native tree species, does very li- little for sustaining native biodiversity and can also create other problems such as um, huge uses of water that uh, are diverting water from agriculture or, or from other kinds of conditions. And they can also be very ineffective for for erosion control, for example. If these areas are harvested, there can be a lot of soil erosion. And they may not yield long-term carbon storage um, if the harvesting cycle then interrupts uh, the carbon storage process. So I think there's an importance of distinguishing between uh, planting trees that are intended to remain in place and to provide habitats for native biodiversity, which means that these should be native tree species and they should be plant planted in the right place at the right time and in the right way. And when done in, in this way, restoration can begin to happen within the area and the trees can be a, a very big part of, of restoring ecosystem services and um, better conditions for, for people living in, in those areas. You've said before that reforestation is a very site-dependent, history-dependent, landscape-dependent activity. Can you walk us through the decision-making process that goes into designing a forest restoration project? Well, the very first step is really making a decision, and this this has to be made by a body of, of stakeholders, not just any one group. A decision that, yes, something needs to happen in this area to improve tree cover. Once that decision is made, Then you begin a series of steps to sort of identify what are the most appropriate ways of bringing back tree cover. And in order to make those decisions, you need to assess what are the obstacles to forest recovery in in these areas. So why, you know, would forest come back on its own? And if not, what is preventing it? It could be because there are frequent fires. It could be because there are no sources of, of seeds around. Um, it could be because the soil has been very degraded and those obstacles need to be assessed within within the area to determine what's, what kind of measures would be needed. And in, in some cases, the answer may be there really are very few obstacles to the forest coming back on their own in, this, in these areas. So we should just allow that to happen. Um, and in other areas, it may be that we need fire protection or we need to keep cattle from coming in and eating all the little trees, or we need to provide certain seeds that aren't available in the landscape. And once you understand what those obstacles are, you can begin to assist the regeneration process, or you may need to completely replant the area if if there's no potential for natural regeneration to happen. And then the next stage is basically monitoring the site and seeing if if you have left it for natural regeneration, are there indicators that this is in fact occurring? And it happens slowly. So you have to look at at small plants and what's coming in. If you've planted trees or if you have tried to remove obstacles, is that working? Um, So you basically monitor the interventions you took. And then 
after some time you decide, you know, is this really the right, uh, the right decision? Um, do I really, maybe I don't need to continue planting or, or uh, managing the plantations. Maybe I should just abandon that and let, let nature take its course. It seems to be going very well. Or maybe I need to plant different kinds of trees in this area because the ones we planted aren't working well. So you keep revisiting and deciding, you know, if you get this system on a better path to recovery, and and then once once you've evaluated that, then you decide, you know, is it really going to do fine on its own? Do I need to continue interventions in this area, or um, can I move on and, and work with the restoration in some other areas? So it's really a very stage by stage type of prescription that you can apply to to make sure that, you know, number one, you're not wasting time and resources. And number two, that the system is really proceeding along a direction to the the end point, which is where it can con- complete its recovery on its own without needing any more human intervention. These two approaches of tree planting and natural regeneration are sometimes referred to as active versus passive restoration. But you said that you no longer see it as an active passive dichotomy. What do you mean by that? Well, what what I mean by that is that in practice, we often use a combination of interventions that involve both allowing the natural recovery process or encouraging the the recovery process and supplementing that process or providing either seeds or planting seedlings to accelerate the process or or kind of make sure that it becomes uh, firmly established and then later relying on natural regeneration to sort of move it to the next stage. So this distinction between active and passive restoration has is really distorted and it it's not how most things actually happen in reality and how most practitioners uh, think about it so we're trying to uh, sort of remove that vocabulary and think more about a continuum of interventions that are needed and ways of indicating what uh, level of intervention is required which also implies a certain level of investment in time and money and, and uh, participation of in evaluating that process. And it may be as conditions change, you know, we need to, there's a need to adjust those interventions. So that's part of the adaptive management uh, process. But it, it, it really doesn't mean that it's all or nothing, that we just leave it all alone or we do massive costly interventions. In practice, uh, it's a very fine-tuned, place-based process that involves sort of doing what's needed to assist the recovery process. And that could be a little or it could be a lot. You actually wrote a paper that includes a decision tree for planning a reforestation initiative, right? Yep. It came out in the, the journal Restoration Ecology. It's called The Intervention Continuum in Restoration Ecology, Rethinking the Active-Passive Dichotomy. And I'm the first author, but uh, we have Donald Falk, Lindsay Bannon, Marcus Wagner, Sarah Wilson, Robert Grabowski, and Kate Suding, also uh, our co-authors of this paper. And it's not just about forest ecosystems. We have sections talking about how this framework would apply to forests, to grasslands, to rivers, and to peatlands as well. You mentioned that multiple approaches are sometimes used in one landscape. So maybe native forests are being restored, but there's also some commercial forestry operations involved as well. I know there's often overlap between reforestation projects and agroforestry or silvopasture operations. But how common is it to include multiple use cases like this in a reforestation project? It's very common when the reforestation is sort of uh, implemented in the context of forest and landscape restoration which by its very nature implies uh, a variety of interventions within a broader landscape that are attuned to the needs of the local people. So one example of that might be if you have a a landscape including some hills or mountains or mountain valleys and, and, uh, and streams or rivers, what you might imagine is that on the flat areas, there's already been conversion of forest for agriculture, either grazing or croplands. So there are ways of bringing more trees into those agricultural systems through agroforestry or silvopastoral interventions. And that can have a lot of advantages for both the environment and and for biodiversity. And it it, it can also, also feed back and improve crop production. There's several examples of that. On the slopes, 
Um, there may be some opportunities for uh, natural regeneration of, of native forests if there are patches of vegetation in the area and good sources of seed. Um, so we could have, you could have natural regeneration on, on some of the upper slopes and maybe some forest plantations on the lower slopes to provide uh, their firewood or other kind of timber products, um, but that are maybe composed of, of uh, mixtures of species, including native species. And then along the stream banks, you could have riparian restoration to improve the water quality, um, to avoid agricultural runoff into streams, sedimentation. So it's a, a whole landscape approach, but involving different interventions that target particular kinds of land uses, but all with the goal of improving and increasing tree cover in the landscape. So tree planting campaigns have become really popular these days, and it's climate mitigation that's driving most of those kinds of initiatives, right? Yes, and I, I think, too, the, the, the tree planting industry, because if you could call it that now, it very is very uh, suited to uh, corporations as well as to governments who want to show very quick response um, and who want to offset carbon emissions through supporting tree planting efforts. But this is a, an example of, of a sort of an effort to do something quick and dirty, which is not necessarily going to really help. There are examples of tree planting that are beneficial, but it, it has to really be the right tree in the right place at the right time and in the right way. And it really needs to engage the local communities if, if it's going to be a long-term effort because they have to be living with the, these trees and they ha their lives have to, be, have to adjust to the changes in land use within uh, the landscapes where they live. So if, we, if you don't get the local people engaged and plant the trees that they want that are providing benefits for them, ultimately it's going to fail. Um, and there are examples of failures of tree planting already, including you know, a very detailed study in, in India that, that looked at reforestation projects that had little to show, little of any benefit to show for what they had done and for a lot of money spent. So it it's really important to look at the details. The details matter uh, hugely. And there is space for, for doing this the right way. But again, it really has to, it can't just be a top-down project, you know, a three-year project to get lots of trees in the ground. It really has to have a long-term scope and uh, engage the local people in a way that benefits them. What does it look like to really sufficiently engage local communities in reforestation initiatives? Well, in, in a lot of cases with large-scale tree planting, the local communities are sort of seen as, as a workforce, basically. And they, they may be paid for their work. And they're basically used as a, sort of a testing ground for, for pilot projects um, that the government wants to show or that a corporation wants to advertise. Um, look, look what great stuff we're doing. Um, so... Uh, many cases, those local people do not have any say in what trees are being planted. They may not even be trees that they know how to use or that they're familiar with. And in many cases, when, when local people are given the, the right to decide what trees, they will plant uh, trees that they know will grow in the area that they have some familiarity with. They tend to be native tree species that have particular properties that the farmers like. And they know how to extract products from them. They could be medicinal uh, uses. They could be for fodder, for livestock. Um, they could be for supporting biodiversity, attracting birds or, or mammals that um, the people use or want to attract to the area. So those are not necessarily the same trees that would be in these large-scale tree planting projects. Uh, in many cases, we don't have um, greenhouses stocked full of, of these native tree species that are ready to be planted out. Or um, the local authorities, would uh, they insist on planting trees rather than um, just allowing natural regeneration to occur, which, which could be a good source of some of these local tree species. So there seems to be, it's sort of like a factory model of restoration, a corporate factory model that you know, may, may 
be useful on that on their end, but doesn't really help the local people. You mentioned the failed tree planting initiatives in India. What are the repercussions of planting the wrong trees in the wrong place? There are a variety of repercussions, both on the biophysical side and also on the social side. So there, you could be planting trees that are taking up excessive amounts of water and therefore reducing the water available for households and for farms. And this has been a problem in South Africa where they're yanking a lot of trees out of the ground because because of these problems. You could be planting trees that are going to become sort of, uh, areas vulnerable to fire and uh, therefore inviting fire into a community um, where that hadn't been a risk before. And on the social side, it 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 reduces the trust that local communities have of government agencies or, or NGOs that are involved in these activities because they're not taking the people's needs into account. And, you know, the next time around when they want to involve the community, you know, they mem- the, the community members may not be very willing to even talk with them um, because of so many times of sort of being um, offended <laughs> and ignored um, in this process. So uh, there are lots of costs, including social costs, that come from uh, these kinds of mistakes. So how effective do you think these massive tree planting campaigns are likely to be? And how long will it take for us to see the benefits or failures of these projects? Well, trees are long-lived organisms, so you don't see immediate uh, results in terms of the carbon storage, for example. You might see that within a 10-year period. And you might be able to get indicators of that within three to five years of how well the trees are growing by looking at their survival rate and uh, by looking at how well they're being maintained um, by the local people. So there are some indicators that that will sort of give you an idea of what is the future likelihood of success instead of indicators of just the effort in planting, like how many trees were planted or how many hectares were planted. That tells you about the effort, but it doesn't tell you about the actual outcomes. So indicators of outcomes, which we call leading indicators, might might be information, for example, on survival rate or um, interviews with people about how what are their perceptions of of the changes in their landscape and how willing are they to continue uh, working with with these trees? And are they willing, are they getting any products from these trees or planning to? So those kind of forward-looking indicators could be adopted more often to to give a, a better indication of is this working now and is it likely to continue working in the future? So would you say that a common pitfall of these campaigns is that they focus too much on the number of trees that are put in the ground? And would the better alternative be to target the benefits that are desired and then design the program around delivering those benefits as opposed to just the sheer number of trees planted? Absolutely. It's it's much, much easier to provide effort-based indicators um, than to really you know, go into the community and, and get more detailed information about, about these outcomes. But ultimately that is really how it should operate. Not to say that these other indicators are worthless, but that, that they should be supplemented with other kinds of information that really evaluate whether the outcomes are going to be successful. That's why we're, we're trying to build in guidelines and build in principles. Um, we have principles for ecosystem restoration now. We have principles for forest and landscape restoration. Um, but all of this is voluntary, right? And there's there's really nobody keeping score, <laughs> so to speak, of, of how well you're doing. So we really need to to, I think, up that game and actually start getting metrics um, for different tree planting efforts that really, you know, confirm whether or not they're being, these are leading to successful outcomes. I know some countries are including reforestation initiatives in their nationally determined contributions or NDCs, their emissions reductions commitments under the Paris Climate Agreement. And then there's also the Bond Challenge, a global initiative to restore 350 million hectares or about 865 million acres of degraded and deforested land by 2030. But is anyone tracking the actual progress being made towards fulfilling those commitments? There is an effort called the Bond Challenge Barometer that is attempting to track these efforts. It is based on the country level uh, responses. So those same high level administrators that are making these commitments are the ones that are reporting to the bond challenge commitments. So 
I'm not sure that that's going to be very transparent. There is still a very huge gap between these high-level aspirations and targets and on the ground actions. And there is not a mechanism for tracking that is really based on the ground level outcomes. Uh, So I think we're relying very much on researchers and on uh, local NGOs to to begin to uh, be more active in documenting uh, what is actually happening on the ground. But there's no standard format for doing this yet. Um, There are a group of many people interested in becoming more rigorous about tracking progress both in terms of remote sensing based information that tells you, you know, is our trees increasing in the landscape or shrubs or green cover? Is that increasing according to the plan? Um, that can be tracked by remote sensing now. But the uh, social and economic impacts that these efforts are having and the effects on water supplies and other, other kinds of ground based like soil erosion those require ground-based data and um, you know who's going to be responsible for taking that. In some cases, communities can band together and begin to do that um, if they have the right kind of, of training. And I think we need, we need to empower more of these sort of grassroots efforts to document uh, what's happening on the ground, either you know good things or bad things, because otherwise we're not going to be getting that information. So do we have any idea how much land is being restored around the world right now? We don't. There are a number of efforts that are showing some some good progress. In particular, in Brazil now has a reforestation and restoration observatory set up that is using remote sensing, high resolution remote sensing. And that is able to distinguish uh, monoculture tree plantations, for example, from uh, multi-species plantings or natural regeneration. So that's a really good start. So I think we're seeing, we, we're beginning to really get the tools to do this. It's just a question of pulling together the resources to organize these, these types of collaborative arrangements uh, to make this information uh, transparent to the public as well. Um, but I think the more that starts to happen, the more people will begin to realize they have to be accountable for their efforts and that, that uh, they're being watched and there could be implications in the future for, for their work if they, if they don't make an effort to track their, their outcomes better. It's still, it's a very active area right now. We're certainly, there's a lot of remote sensing tools available. There's also a lot of other ways of, of reporting ground level information through, through cell phones and through other kinds of, of digital technology that, that um, even people in the countryside can use. Recording into growth of individual trees, for example, by using cell phones. So there's there's a lot of potential for this sort of ground-based monitoring and uh, community oversight to happen. It's just a question of really scaling that up so that it it it's in providing enough overall information to guide activities. Are there maybe one or two projects that you would point to as flagship reforestation initiatives that were successful? Absolutely. And we're actually compiling a set of flagship restoration case studies exactly for this purpose. They're not only on forest ecosystems, but many of them do focus on on reforestation. Um, And our first case is about uh, community-based forest restoration in Ecuador, in in the Andes, where uh, the farmers, a local NGO worked with the farmers to help them increase forest cover um, in the region, and it has been very successful. It was all community based. Another example that we write about uh, is comes from northern Thailand, in which there was a local a community that wanted to do reforestation um, in in their region, and they worked with a group of restoration ecologists from the Chiang Mai University Forest Restoration Unit to bring that about. So again, a really wonderful collaboration between uh, scientists and and local villagers. A third example that we talk about is in Brazil in the Atlantic Forest, where um, there was a Instituto Terra developed to restore um, a very degraded cattle ranch and became involved in restoration around the whole region in the Rio Doce watershed, which unfortunately had a terrible disaster when the Mariana Dam broke and released all of that sludge down the watershed. And they were there to 
help with the restoration effort and to provide seedlings. And it's a wonderful example of how a local restoration project was able to really become involved in the, in the whole landscape and watershed region. And uh, I'm writing up now one on the Guanacaste uh, National Park and uh, Area de Conservación Guanacaste in dry forest region of northwestern Costa Rica that was able to um, purchase farms that were using market prices and with um, incorporating those farms into the, the protected area and keeping fires out, preventing fires and allowing the forest to regrow. And they have restored 40,000 hectares of native forest cover that way without having to plant trees. And they uh, were able to restore areas in the wetter forests as well. In some cases, using uh, melina trees as a sort of as a nurse species. And then those trees later died, but the, the forest regrew under those. So there's some excellent examples out there. And I have to say, almost every case is really based on community action and community engagement and visionary people who from the very start got all of the right people involved and engaged in, in doing this work as a long-term sustainable effort. Those efforts, the, the, the really successful large-scale efforts that we have found are not those, uh, those top-down ones you know, where the government said we're going to plant a million trees or um, where an NGO said we're going to plant a million trees. These are efforts that really started on the ground and then they found the expertise they needed and the technical help and the resources to do what they needed to do. So you did a long-term study of regrowing forests in Costa Rica. Can you tell us what you found? This is what really got me engaged in the whole arena of restoration. Back in uh, the early 90s, uh, we started doing research on naturally regenerating forests in northeastern Costa Rica. And just studying what trees were coming in and how they were growing and who was coming in as seedlings and what their survival was and their growth rates and how the trees were getting recruited. These were areas that where there was no intervention other than the cattle that had been grazing in the pasture were, were removed. And in some cases, a fence was put up. But generally, these areas were just let alone and they began regrowing. And in 1997, we set up some long-term plots as well. And we kept those monitoring those every year for 20 years. And we ended up having 10 plots in the end. And we also collaborated with a group from Katia that had some plots as well. So there were there were actually 12 plots at one point. And in all of these cases, uh, we were able to really understand what is the process of tree recruitment over time, what trees are coming in, how they're growing, uh, what trees are dying, what is the thinning process, the natural thinning process that happens during uh, forest regeneration, which had never been documented before, except in plantations. And we are getting a lot of really useful insights uh, from this work. One of the things that we have found is the very rapid accumulation of biomass, and that means carbon storage uh, within these young regrowing ecosystems. This is a very wet climate, so it is sort of the optimal conditions for tree growth. And the soils in this region are, are fairly fertile. So it's kind of like go, 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 almost the maximum potential amount of carbon you can, you can store with a terrestrial ecosystem. We've also discovered what happens with the internal dynamics of the forest. So initially they become very dense, but a lot of those trees that come in early in the process are light demanding. And if they get shaded out, they will die. So we st we're starting to see a lot of this a wave of mortality going through these early tree recruits, the ones that didn't make it all the way up to the canopy. And um, in the meantime, we're getting a lot of recruitment of shade tolerant species, which are also fairly common in the older forests. So we're getting a pretty rapid recovery of the species composition um, in that process. And that can happen within, within 30 to 40 years, particularly in the lower levels of the forest. We have the components of the mature forest tree community which have come in and they're just waiting to take their place up in the canopy. And some of these trees are very slow growing, so that's going to take quite a while. Others are, are, are fairly fast growing. So we're discovering uh, a lot of uh, variation in the growth rates of the native tree species. And some of them are, are much earlier going to occupy the canopy and then produce seeds and then uh, produce a lot more offspring. 
So it's a really interesting process to, to understand how, how these forests recover. And they're also recovering a lot of the, the bird species and the mammal species. They already are in these forests when they're very young. So it's the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Can you wrap up just by saying something about why it's so important to restore forests and other ecosystems over the next decade and presumably over the following decades after that? Sure. And, and I've, I've come quite involved in, in several aspects of the UN Decade, um, hope to remain involved for a long time. I think one of the important things about the way they're framing uh, this, the work within the decade is that it's about protecting uh, as well as restoring forests. So we need to really work just as hard to protect the remaining forest if we want to have forests in the future. So that's very important. We can't just restore and forget about conserving what, what is left and we have to halt deforestation and forest degradation. The other thing is we really need to develop a global movement that restoration is as much about the social aspects as it is about the biophysical aspects. And it's not just a, a question of planting trees or making it look nice. It really is about changing values and b- rebuilding societies based around uh, an ethic uh, that incorporates the value of forests and, and, and other intact ecosystems as well. The decade is not just about forests. I'm hoping that this time around, there really will be uh, a deep effort within society to to bring restoration into into all of our our systems, our social systems, as well as our biological systems. Now we'll turn to my conversation with Karen Hull to continue digging into what makes for successful forest restoration projects. We started off by talking about the differences between active and passive restoration and what conditions are conducive to the success of each approach. Much like Robin Chasden, Hull doesn't think of it as an active versus passive dichotomy as much as a continuum of intervention. Restorations interventions span along a gradient of intervention. So that's the, at the one end, you have natural regeneration in which you're leaving a forest. We'll focus on forests today. You're allowing the, you're removing the disturbance like grazing or crop growing. And then you're allowing the forest to recover with no intervention from humans. At the other end of the spectrum, you have what the Society for Ecological Restoration calls reconstruction or is often known one approach is, is tree planting where you have a lot of intervention. And so you're planting trees. Sometimes you're also fertilizing. You may be uh, loosening up the soil, doing um, various interventions. And then there's a spectrum in the middle of different levels of intervention. So you might assist regeneration. So mostly allow the forest to recover on its own, but then go out and clear around some of the seedlings that are establishing naturally to reduce competition with grasses. Or in some cases, people will go out and clear fire breaks to prevent fires coming through. And then you proceed across the spectrum to perhaps doing some tree planting in small patches or along waterways to other cases where, as I said, you might be completely intervening and also doing other things to increase the nutrients and to really protect the trees over time. So what are the factors necessary for natural regeneration to be able to occur? So natural regeneration, there's lots of examples of forests that have regenerated naturally. We can look at the eastern hardwood forest in the United States, which was logged around the 1800s. And now almost all the forest that we see there is naturally regenerated forests. Of course, there are also areas where people have planted, particularly for timber plantations. What we see as factors that tend to affect recovery, um, the recovery rates, one is how intensively the land's been used in the past. For instance, we find in our work in Costa Rica that two-thirds of the difference in how fast trees grow is explained by how long the land was used for cattle. And so some of those really intensive uses for long periods of time can mean that it recovers more slowly, whereas if you just have shifting agriculture for a couple of years, it might recover more quickly. It also depends whether there are sources of Um, native flora and fauna in the area. So if there's nearby forests, there can also be sometimes remnant trees and animals that use um, agricultural landscapes itself from tree cover, but you need to have nearby forests. 
Um, I recently reviewed a dissertation of um, a student studying recovery in palm oil plantations where the nearest forest or source of populations was 30 kilometers away. And so that would make it very difficult for the forest. He was specifically looking at insects, but for the insects to colonize or to recover on their own. And so those are a couple of the, the biggest factors is how intensively land use is and whether there are sources nearby. It also depends some on the just general ecology and resilience of the forest. In general, wetter, warmer places, forests, they grow faster and they recover more quickly. It also depends on you know, how the plants regenerate. If there's a lot of wind dispersed species or they regenerate from resprouting, then those are more likely to come back. We see, for instance, where I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and we've recently had a lot of fires, but there are redwoods and redwoods respout from the base. And so we really don't need to be going out and replanting redwoods because they're resprouting on their own. And so if there are no nearby seed sources, like an intact area of forest, is that the line at which tree planting becomes necessary? As I said, it depends on all sorts of factors. And one of the things about planting trees, you're never... If you don't have a seed source available, or not just plants, but also animals, we can never go out and plant every species that in the forest that was there. And so if there's not a potential for them to recover, then yes, it's going to be, you can go out and plant trees, but you're probably never going to get the forest back really well because we can't go back in and reintroduce every species of bird and fungus and and understory plant that wouldn't be planted as part of tree planting. So there's a lot of factors that decide whether you need to actively plant trees. The other reason is I've, I've spoken mostly so far about ecological factors, but really another key question about whether you plant trees whether versus allowing natural regeneration is the goals of the project. If people, um, if, if the goal of the project is to reforest for timber or to, um, to plant crops that people can, tree crops that people can get some income from, like fruit trees, then those will likely need to be planted because we don't have a lot of control over which species colonize naturally. So it really depends. If the goal is to recreate a a natural forest, then natural regeneration can work really well if those ecological uh, obstacles that I just spoke about, if those, um, if, if the right conditions are present. So as you mentioned, we can't really plant the number of trees or the diversity of species that make up a native forest. So there have been a number of strategies developed for planting trees. And you actually co-authored a paper in 2011 with Jeffrey Corbin of Union College about one such strategy called applied nucleation. Can you tell us about that just to give us a sense of what these kinds of tree planting strategies entail? So as you noted, We forests largely are going to naturally regenerate regardless of whether trees are planted. We can't reintroduce all the species of animals and plants and fungi into those areas. And so what I see my role as an ecologist is, is trying to think about how can we develop the most cost-effective and most ecologically sound strategies to facilitate that recovery process. So One of the ways I thought about doing this is, well, how does the forest naturally recover? And if you go out to an old field and you look at, um, you know, when you abandon land, it doesn't, the trees don't establish in rows and rows of trees, they establish patchily. And we know that that's how forests naturally recover. You have certain patches of, of vegetation established, and then those tend to help facilitate the establishment of other species. So particularly in tropical forests where I work, What we know is that a lot of the recovery depends, a lot of the the tree species are dispersed by animals and there may be thousands of tree species, so we can't plant them all. And so by planting certain trees that then attract other fauna, primarily birds and bats, they can bring in and disperse the other species. We also know that um, these patches of trees can shade out some of the grasses that were there. They aren't native grasses, they're actually grasses from Africa. African savannas that they plant for the cattle, they shade those grasses out and then there's less competition for the tree seedlings. So since we know that the forest recovers patchily, so what we thought was, well, wouldn't it be more ecologically sound and also more cost-effective if we plant, we call applied nucleation because the idea is that you plant these nuclei or patches of trees and then slowly those patches grow over time. So What happens is, again, they attract, as the trees get taller, they attract birds and bats who disperse seeds, which we found they do quite effectively. And then they also, those patches themselves, the trees grow, 
they shade out the grasses, and then so it facilitates recovery. What that does, it means that you spend a lot less money on planting and um, maintaining the trees. It also means that it's a more natural looking landscape. It's not just rows and rows of trees, but there are different habitats, more open areas, and it looks more like a natural forest. And it's a strategy that we've tested in Costa Rica. It's a study that I have that we've been studying now for 17 years. So we've been able to watch the forest establish. What we've done is at 15 different sites, we compared three different ways the forest could recover. We just allowed for natural regeneration. In another treatment, we planted rows of trees in the standard tree planting plantation format. And we only planted four species of trees. The idea was that these trees would then again facilitate recovery. And then our other treatment is applying these tree islands. We planted tree islands or nuclei to see how it would facilitate recovery. And what we find is that now after, you know, after a decade that actually the applied nucleation or planting these islands of trees and planting the whole area with trees. So about four times as many trees, we see fairly similar rates of naturally establishing seedlings so that these the applied nucleation is having a similar effect to planting a lot of trees from a standpoint of the number of birds that we have, the number of seeds that are being dispersed, the number of seedlings that are being established. And they're both really accelerating recovery compared to just letting the forest regenerate naturally. We do find that the natural regeneration plots are slowly over time recovering too, but just not quite as quickly. So all forest restoration, even if you are planting trees, is going to rely to some extent on natural regeneration. Absolutely, because forests aren't just trees. Forests include all sorts of other types of plants. There are understory plants, there are some in the shrub layer. In tropical forests, there's a lot of epiphytes, which are plants along other plants. And most of those are not being reintroduced. And particularly in diverse systems, we can't bring all those species back in. And then, of course, there's all the fauna um, that are part of the forest, you know, insects and birds and bats and mammals. And the assumption is generally that they are going to colonize on their own. There are a few restoration projects that may focus a specific target species, but mostly the assumption is that you build it and then they will come and colonize. And so, yes, all forests, we depend on nearby sources of populations to come in and to colonize naturally. And so what you're trying to do is to hopefully speed up that natural process, that process, if it, if it is slow, then to speed it up by planting some trees. And I should say that the trees, our particular study looked at the idea of planting, you know, we, we plant sort of patches of trees that they're squares, other people use other approaches, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there are different ways you can plant in a more patchy manner. For instance, you might want to prioritize area where there weren't trees naturally established, or sometimes people focus on planting trees along waterways, or my colleague, Pedro Brancaleone at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, we're testing the idea of planting patches of trees, but he also wanted to try planting sort of strips of trees. So you alternate planted areas and then open area and planted. And we, he wanted to test that strategy because he thought it would be more practical to implement because they do a lot of their, their soil preparation and planting mechanically in rows. And so there's a lot of different ways that you could plant trees and not be as homogeneous as using a, a planting the entire area in a forest plantation. And also that uses less resources, costs less. We hear a lot about reforestation projects these days, mostly these big tree planting campaigns. But if someone comes to you for advice about starting a reforestation program, what advice would you give them about the best approach, the best way to design and implement their reforestation project? The first question that I ask is, what are the goals of the project? People have, uh, both funders and the implementing organizations, have really lofty goals from all these benefits we're going to get from, um, from I, I like to call it growing trees rather than planting, because um, you, planting trees is just putting them in the ground, but growing trees is ensuring that those trees survive over time for the benefits that we want. So I tend to refer to tree growing. And also, we, as we've talked about, you don't necessarily need to plant trees for them to grow. But if somebody comes to me and says, you know, well, I want to, you know, grow trees, I ask why, because the goal of the project really affects how you go about doing it. As I said earlier, if your goal is to provide local landholders who are doing, using the land for agricultural purposes, some income and try to improve their livelihoods, then you're probably going to use an agroforestry system in which you're going to actively go out and plant trees 
of the species they want, or one of the things that's done a lot in Africa now that's working quite effectively is called farmer managed natural regeneration. And so if they have trees re-sprouting on their land is to facilitate the and protect the re-sprouts that are coming in, but they're interplanted, that those are intermixed with, with crops. And that's been shown to be quite successful, particularly in fairly arid areas in, in Northern Africa. And so, you know, if that's your goal, then you're going to focus on economically valuable trees. If your goal is to restore forests to some semblance of what was there before, then I do encourage people to think about whether the forest is going to regenerate naturally. And one of the ways to do that is to to either look at other areas in the region and how well are they regenerating naturally, or I encourage people to give the land a couple of years and see if how much regeneration happens naturally. If it does regenerate naturally, then maybe you don't need to intervene. Another potential intervention that's sometimes done is to do what's called enrichment planting. And and what that means is that if if you leave the area and it starts to regenerate naturally, there are necessarily going to be some species that colonize and some that are more that colonize more slowly. And the ones that tend to colonize earlier tend to be those that have small seeds that are dispersed easily, those that re-sprout that we were talking about. But sometimes some of the seeds, the species with really large seeds that either drop by gravity or require bats or birds with really large bills, you know, gape width for their mouth to disperse, they don't come in as much. So maybe you leave it for a number of years and then you plant specifically the species that didn't, um, you enrich the planting by planting species that weren't, didn't colonize naturally. And so first of all, thinking about what your goals are and then thinking about the ecology of the system and how you would tailor your planting effort to acknowledge that natural regeneration and what is natural re- regenerating and how fast that happens. You were discussing your research in Costa Rica earlier, and you actually wrote a paper in 2018 called Rules of Thumb for Predicting Tropical Forest Recovery based on that research. What are the rules of thumb that you and your co-authors wrote about? So as I mentioned in my experiment in southern Costa Rica, we, had, we started with about 15 sites. And we would go out every year and we would, we did, as I said, we had three different treatments at each site, planting the whole area, planting islands of trees, and then no planting. And we go out every year and we measure the diversity and the number of trees that are naturally colonizing, regenerating. And what we found was that some sites, like in the first year or two, had lots of trees, lots of tree seedlings there, and other ones didn't have that many. So we noticed that, but then every year we would go out and the same sites that had a lot of trees to begin with, they kept getting more trees and the other ones tended to be slower. And so there was a lot of variation across the landscape. Um, and we tried to explain the difference in that variation and what ex- would explain that. And not a lot of variables, like we took soil nutrients and we looked at how fast the water infiltrated and lots of things. But then what we realized was that the same sites that had a lot of seedlings to begin with, they continued to get more seedlings. So we did this analysis and we looked at, well, if we counted, looked at the number of stems and the grass cover and some vegetation parameters after a half a year, a year and a half and two and a half years, and then we looked at longer term recovery at eight years, we found that two variables measured after just a year and a half predicted like on average about two thirds of the recovery um, that happened six and a half years later. And those two variables were how much grass cover there was. If there's less grass cover within a year and a half, then you have more seedlings establishing over the longer term because those grasses tend to be really competitive. And also if you had higher canopy cover from naturally establishing seedlings, you also found a lot more recovery. And so what we were saying is that it seems like, and this is just from our study in Costa Rica, so it would need to be tested elsewhere, is that if you go out pretty early on, like I said, within the first two years, and you see, well, how much grass cover it is in our case and what the canopy cover at that point is, that that's a pretty good predictor of what it'll be, you know, going forward a number of years. And so that would give you some indication as to how much active planting you'd actually do. The other thing we found that another big factor that did explain it was how long the land has been cleared. So land that had been cleared longer tended to recover more slowly. And so that gets back to my point of, you know, when can you use natural regeneration? Well, in general, it's tends, there tends to be more regeneration if the land has not been used as long or as intensively for whatever use it's being used. Um, typically, it's some range of agriculture or grazing, but 
lands that, for instance, have been mined and really intensively used, those don't tend to regenerate as much on their own. Is there a difference in terms of carbon sequestration potential between naturally regenerated forests and planted forests? That depends on a number of factors. And it depends in part on what tree species you're planting. It also depends on the time period you're looking at. The studies that I have seen suggest that if you plant fast growing trees in rows, that you will sequester carbon more quickly than natural regeneration. It also depends on how fast the forests regenerate naturally. But those numbers tend to even out over time as the trees start to mature and you have more regeneration happening. So there seems to be a time where they converge. But like I said, it all depends on how fast the natural regeneration is happening. And it also depends on what species are colonizing because it's not only the size of the trees, but different trees tend to have more dense wood. So they would sequester more carbon. Those tend to be slower growing trees. So it's it's sort of a hedgy answer there. In general, in the short term, yes, planting trees will generally get you more carbon immediately, but those tend to even out. And it really, the the differential varies a lot. And what about the climate resiliency of restored forests? Are we able to select for the best tree species to plant that will survive in future climatic conditions? Or does natural regeneration do a better job of selecting for trees that will be most resilient in the face of climate change? It's a really interesting question. And again, it's hard to give a general answer. Uh, we also, I, we haven't really had studies like that to look at, you know, to, to look, to be able to compare those because of the time involved. So I'm speculating here um, as I answer this to a certain degree. I, again, that depends how the tree planting is done. If you went out and you specifically chose trees, and there are people talking about this now who are trying to pick species both species and genetic compositions of, spe- of individual species that are more adapted to stressful conditions or you know, warmer, drier conditions, then yes, you might potentially have higher survivability. However, at the scale that tree growing is being done now, not many groups are taking doing that careful screening to look at that. So, so that's sort of in favor of the planting idea. It also depends on how many tr- species of trees you're planting. I would argue that you probably want to be planting a mix of species of trees, whereas a lot of tree growing efforts are focused, there's planting a, f- you know, a few species. And so the more species you have, the more likely you are going to have to some survive. On the argument of natural regeneration, you tend to have a diversity of species colonizing. You also have a certain selection filter that they have to establish, you know, in open areas, and they have to be adapted to stressful conditions. And so in many ways, you're selecting for the species that are most likely to be adapted to these stressful conditions. So there's sort of arguments on either side. I would have to argue that probably in general, um, I would think natural regeneration would be more resilient just because of the range of different species that you get, and that some of those will be ones that are adapted to future climate conditions. But a lot of factors in there to really be able to say that one is better or worse in thinking about which one's going to be most resilient to climate change. What, to your mind, are some of the best examples of successful forest restoration? As I mentioned earlier, there are examples where we see a lot of natural regeneration that's happened. And the one I tend to turn to is the eastern United States. Most people don't even know that most of the forests there are secondary forests naturally regenerated. The same is true here where I live in coastal California, where most of the redwoods were logged around um, the beginning of early 1900s or late 1800s, early 1900s, and they're mostly second growth too. And so there, there are plenty of examples like that. Puerto Rico, there's a lot of forests that regenerated there when people moved from agricultural lands to cities. So there's lots of examples of in the past how systems that have naturally regenerated on their own. There's also examples if you go to like Mayan ruins in Mexico and you yeah, and you see that all these, you know, these temples are overgrown with forest. They've all regenerated. So there's lots of examples of where we've had regeneration. And as far as tree, more recent tree growing successes, I'd say that in general, there are a lot more failures, but there, there are good examples. And one that I often point to was where my colleague, Pedro Brancaleon works in, in the Atlantic Forest in Brazil, where they had a lot of failures. And then they brought together the Atlantic Forest Pact, which is a group of over 270 organizations, including universities, governmental organizations, restoration firms, and various other groups that are involved. 
And they're all working together to help come up with better methodologies for forest restoration, to develop monitoring protocols, to um, try to do better planning and goal setting. And so there's some really good examples of some very large uh, successful forest restoration projects in the Brazilian Atlantic forests. One of the key ingredients that we see over and over again that is a key to success, if you look at successes, it tends to be where the local stakeholders are involved and they're part of the process because they really have to be engaged and want to have buy-in and be getting income from the land in order for these projects to succeed. It generally top-down projects where a country, you know, or an organization comes from outside and says, you know, you're going to plant trees here. They, they don't tend to do very well. What are the social aspects that have to be taken into consideration? And I know specifically you co-authored a paper on the hidden costs of passive restoration. What were those hidden costs? Well, as I said, generally, one of the key factors, and you see it over and over again, that in some ways, these social obstacles are more of an obstacle successful process than the ecological obstacles. And it means that really engaging stakeholders, making sure that the people, you know, whoever's funding the project, who's implementing the project, that their goals are the same and you have a strategy that's appropriate to meet those goals, which I've talked about already. So that's really important. With the specific paper that you're asking about, what we found was that we think that ecologically there's a lot of arguments in favor of using this applied nucleation tree island planting approach. But we found that there were some social perceptions that people had that in general, um, people what we talk about is sort of heterogeneity or a more natural forest tends to be something that's not quite as organized in the way that people think about landscaping on their lands. And so it kind of looks messy to them. And as I said before, you know, particularly when you're working with small landowners, they want to earn money from their, from whatever they're using their land for. So what we found was that in our sites that were naturally regenerated or planted just with patches of trees, the landowners would, some of them, not all of them, would think that it looked kind of messy because we weren't clearing around the trees and we were just letting the forests regrow. They also would ask us why we weren't planting timber valuable trees throughout the plot because that's what they were seeing with, with value. And so the point was that we tended to have more times where landowners would come and you know, they want to put their cattle in our land or things like that. Now we're having a different problem, which is now they want in our plantations, they want to come in and log the trees because they're big enough. So sort of perceptions change over time. Um, but the point being is that you really have to think about what people, what they like, what they're interested in, how they're going to economically get use of the land. And there is this perception by some people that they would rather have I, as I was saying earlier, I perceive a forest of rows and rows of trees, not really as a natural forest, but for some people, that's how they see that the land is being used productively. And so really understanding and what the sort of perceptions are of the people who are, are, who own the land and who use the land, and then making sure that those are compatible with the goals of the project are really important. Well, would you mind leaving us with some final thoughts on the importance of restoring forests to create a more sustainable future for all life on this planet and the importance of getting it right and planting the right trees in the right place? The first thing I always say, and this is as somebody who's a restoration ecologist and has spent my life figuring out how to better, or trying to figure out how to better restore forests, the most important thing that we need to be doing is we need to be protecting intact habitat. We know that it's really hard to restore forests and almost any type of ecosystem. It's kind of like Humpty Dumpty. And when, you know, the egg breaks, it's much easier to pull something apart than it is to put it back together again. And so it's super important that we're protecting our existing habitats. It's also important for climate change. And I always say this too, that we're not going to plant our way out of climate change. That's one piece of the puzzle to slowing climate change, but we absolutely need to be drastically and rapidly reducing greenhouse gas emissions because we need to be working on all fronts to address climate change. Tree planting is not a silver bullet. That said, it is one potential solution to help conserve biodiversity and also to, um, at the same time, sequester carbon and potentially to improve human livelihoods, though there's a lot of trade-offs there. And so that's why really prioritizing goals is important. But there is a lot of potential and we see some really good examples of how we can really get a lot of benefits, both ecologically and socially from restoring forests and other habitats. 
If you enjoy the Manga Bay Newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month would really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash manga bay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay newscast more than a quarter of a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. If you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks. <laughs>